Welcome to Wild Questions. I'm Sabbath Kapahu, and this is the moment we take each week to have the conversation we know are important, but we don't always talk about. This is about the stories that matter behind the questions we ask. I'm joined by my friend, colleague, and CEO of Wild Leaders, Dr. Rob McKenna. Last time we talked about becoming a, pu a better public speaker. Today we're going to talk about how to show up on stage. What do you actually do when you get up on stage? So Dr. Rob McKenna, tell me, last time we talked about uh, six things to become a better public speaker for whole impact and not necessarily for numbers. This time we're going to ask questions and talk about what do I do when I get up on stage? I found myself in a public speaking role. What do I do next? Hmm. It's good. All right. Sabbath. This one's fun. The last one was about like preparation of your talk questions. I would put out there. This one's about like, like you said, how do you show up on stage? Um, one of the, the, the first things is this is, um, be aware of the room. Um, it's why most of the time when I speak, I actually step into the room before anyone's in it to kind of move around. And one example of that is being aware of that context. Um, when you get in front of uh, audiences that are trying to, you know, at least when it gets up to a thousand for sure, it's this oftentimes you're on a screen. Mm -hmm. And so realizing this, that um, in those kinds of in larger spaces, they're not looking at you. They're oftentimes looking at you on a screen behind you. And so in those kinds of moments, and I'm not saying that it doesn't start there. I'm not saying you start with a thousand people. That's ridiculous. But when you do, being aware of the room is important. And so I'm using that as an example. So um, that in a room where they're looking at the screen, you have one moment during a talk where you can look directly at the camera if you know where the camera is. And because everyone's looking at the screen, they're going to believe you're looking at them. So it's like it can be a funny moment to use that. It usually only works about once in a 20 minute talk. But I think it's fun to, I just, I love being a student of these kinds of things. And so it's one of the things that's kind of fun to play with and being aware of the room size and the context, the way people are sitting, all that can be very important. Another thing is um, moving with intention. Um, early on in my speaking, I was told that I moved like a cage cat on a stage. And it was because I had a lot of nervous energy. I wasn't like nervous to be speaking, but I just, I, I move a lot. I move my hands a lot and all of that. And so I wasn't moving with intention. And I realized when I watched myself on video that it was it was very distracting. And so doing TED Talks was actually a great continued lesson to that because you have to stay on the dot so you don't get to move like that. But I watched so many speakers who do this on a stage. It is truly like think of a caged cat at a zoo. Like that's what they do. So um, being very intentional about where you step and why is so critical. I mean, I could even go into the details. One time I got feedback from a great speaking coach who said, now think about it, Rob, people read they they when they think about a timeline of past to present we typically um at least in in the united states in our country we tend to think about uh the past is on the left and the mm. future is on the right so when you're speaking to an audience about a timeline it's the opposite right the past is on your right and the sp the future is on your left and so just little things like that i think being a student of that context is really amazing and really can be helpful to audiences um there's another one that you hear all the time is uh, so that first part is about moving with intention. Um, that that's what I was, and then this one's about working out the filler words you use that make you seem uncertain. And we we've all of us have gotten this feedback uh, using phrases like "um." I have one a good friend. It's like who will say "bro" like in a talk, you know, multiple times, or you know what I mean. I think you mentioned that to me in the past. Like there's a speaker you saw where there's certain filler words that in con conversational speaking is now a normal thing. But um, but filler words from a stage, you're not really you're not in a conversation, although you can make it conversational. But those filler words tend to be a distraction for an audience. Um, don't apologize. Mm. Don't apologize. Um, the worst, uh, the sin, the card <laughs> from a stage is if you are over time is saying, I'm sorry, I'm over time. Or uh, those kinds of things are distraction because now people are feeling your anxiety as opposed to hearing what you're talking about. Instead, wrap it up. It up. If you're over time, don't tell them you're over time, but wrap it up. I have edited in real time more talks than you could possibly imagine, but don't apologize. It's just, it's not usually helpful. Use her, use humor if it's your thing. People need to laugh. And I think, I think the being able to feel both pain and laughter in a talk is an amazing thing. And it's part of the human experience. And so using humor in, in like kind of practicing, trying out some things. 
um, that would uh, trying out the way that you're funny because we're funny in different ways, you know, um, figure out if you are a write it all out person who reads or you speak from an outline. Um, and I think that that's can be a really important piece because some of us, I've, I've been speaking actually more lately. You'd think it'd be the other way around, but I used to speak off the cuff all the time. And I'm finding now that I really want to be direct in my messages. And so I'm, I'm, I'm writing them out more often and sometimes even reading them from a stage. So you might think it's the opposite, but for me, it's kind of gone the other way where I'm getting more direct and sometimes writing it down has given me clarity and direction. And it's, it's a little old school, but I think it's becoming more new school. So that's an interesting thing to think about. Find your rhythm. Um, I often start with a story that I know really well that allows me to settle into a new state, a, a, a new stage that I'm on or in that moment. And I'm, I'm a slow warm up person, whether it's in the gym or speaking. And so having a, something I can come out of the gate with really strong um, is really important. And one of the ways I also do that is sometimes I will like, you know, you ask wild card questions a lot of times in our, our moments here. And uh, sometimes I'll open with the wild cards. I'll actually let them talk for five minutes and it changes an entire room. That we're used to being everything. spoken at. Yes. What, what were you saying? That changes everything. It does. Like let yeah. them talk, let them engage. Um, and then a couple of other things um, is this is a weird thing I do. I pick an advocate in the room. I don't care if it's 50 people or if it's, you know, a few thousand people. I'll find a person who looks like they're get they're they're almost like a wise discerning mind and you can usually see them cuz they're like you know what I mean there's that affirmation in their face because I always want to no matter how large the audience is or whether it's you know is that I'm always aware that I may be speaking to one person and if I can focus on the one person I'll probably do a better job of speaking to every one person, if that makes sense. And so I'll pick an advocate almost every time. Um, and those are those are some of the things I, I think there's some things I might describe about what you do afterwards, getting feedback and affirmation. Like you need people to encourage you, but also who will help you become better at it. So being open to that um, is kind of awesome. So I hope that helps folks as they think about some of the, this is just some of the things that I've learned and continue to learn. And what I heard you saying is a lot about self-awareness. Everyone's going to be a different type of speaker. So you have to know who you are when you get up there and okay. be aware of the room, what the yeah. what kind of room you're in. So true. Thank you, Dr. McKenna. I'm going to end our time today again with a wild question. We have this wild deck of cards. Um, I haven't prepared it ahead of time, but we want to leave you with a question uh, today. And the question is, what experience from your past is relevant today? 